Welcome to my humble abode. I am Yoki the Tail Spinner, and this is Tales Over Coffee. The channel where we start the day together with an additive tale and a cup of coffee. And this is the life and suffering of Zabant in the times of fall of the Blessed Agni and Empire. From this month's humble bundle. Uh, let's see how it goes, shall we? we? But it's a story that will follow the life of Zabant from birth to death. We're going to go for a, a new story. The Yorkie Brandt. I'm going to hide the consequences. I'm not going to. I'm going to make the consequences based on character, and not on what they will do. Character restarts. We'll go Iron Man. There's a reason I'm doing both of those, and I've said this before. Um, may or may not have heard me. I'm not sure if I said it on this channel, this new channel. But. For me, success in a narrative game like this does not mean you survive and everyone's happy. It means you follow the story as the story and the world and the character you develop plays out. You didn't betray the character. So I don't want to know the consequences because I want to make choices based on the character. And I don't want to be able to go back because if he dies, he dies. If he gets injured, he gets injured. Whatever happens, that's what happens. You hold the fate of a single man in your hands. You will follow his life from birth to death. Your choices shall define who the brands will grow up to be. You will decide his personality, social status, and what mark he'll leave on history. With every step he takes at your behest, the brand's character will change and evolve. Your decisions will close some doors for him, but open many others. The world of Sir Brandt's birth is a ruthless realm where people are divided into estates. It is hard to be a hero here. Be ready to accept that Sabrant cannot overcome every challenge in his path. Every hard choice will test his character and personal qualities. Often, you will not be able to make the choices you would like to. It may happen because you chose a different road earlier, exhausted your hero's willpower, or haven't earned the right position in society. Every victory will be a struggle, a path paved with bitter losses and gut-wrenching failures. Accept the tragedy. This is how you will create a gripping and unique tale for your hero. What will become of Sir Brandt, his loved ones and his world, it all depends on you. The story of my life remains written on these pages. But my fate has always been my own. Every deed, every choice, every person I met made me what I am. Could I have taken a different path? Could I have found a different calling? Altered the very course of history? And what price would I have to pay? Sadly, the voiceover does not continue through the rest of the story as far as I can see. It will be me reading. At the end of time, your fingers are stained with ink. Your breathings grow rabid, uh, ragged. Rabid? <laughs> your hands are shaking, yet the words begin appearing on the page before you one by one, clinging together to form a chronicle of your own life. Who are you? How did you reach this end? You were born, raised, and lived your entire life in the Blessed Athenian Empire. In this land, a man's destiny is predetermined at the moment of his birth. Whether human or Agnian, nobleman, priest or lowborn commoner. All blend, all bend to the divine will of the twin gods. And each life is naught but a single cog in the universe's immeasurable machine. The memories come flooding back. They engulf you as a merciless wave, binding together uh, days that are thrice dead and gone. The dreams of your childhood, your adolescence, your youth, spent in the capital, years of peace, teeming with life and a war drenched in blood. High ranks and lowly deeds, opulent palaces, secretive cities, back streets, fields of battle and faces, so many faces of the people held dear, the people who walked this road by your side. Such was your life, now all exposed, 
by ink erupting from the page. With your every step, you sought to change the world as you saw it. The choices of your upbringing, the path you carved in your youth, the fruits of your struggle, the consequences of your sacrifice, all of it led you here to the end of your time. And every choice had a price. Now, years and years later, the crossroads of your life echo in your memory. The pain and joy inextricably intermingles. Could you have taken a different path, chosen a different calling, found a different place in the world? You had the power to alter the very course of history. Now on the verge of death, you struggle with doubt, seeking answers to the last and most crucial question of all. Your life, of all the paths in life, why did you walk, walk this one? Did you choose your own fate? Or was your life shaped by forces beyond your control? What determines a man's destiny? This first choice, and we don't know what the consequences are because I turned those off, of course. Um, I just want to say the initial start I, direction I have for Soprano is going to be a pious man. That does not mean a good man. I've long since argued that a good person of faith will use their religion to empower them to do good. A bad person of faith will use it to excuse them doing evil. He will be a man of faith, not necessarily a good man, a conflicted man perhaps. But therefore, as a man of faith, your destiny was forged by a power greater than your own will, a higher power. At the end of time, you put your hands together in the silent prayer, death is near, and you are ready to step beyond the final threshold. Your life was not lived in vain, it was part of a greater design. Like it or not, we are all guided by forces beyond our ken, the same forces that shape the destinies of men and civilizations. No matter how much free will we think we have, we are nothing but obedient instruments in the hands of eternity. True freedom has always lain in understanding the greater laws that govern our tiny lives. But are you right about this? Is it all true? To learn the truth, you will have to return to the very beginning, remembering every step you took along the way. On these pages, the story of a man named Yogi Brandt will live once more. Continue. And our first step is childhood, at zero years of age. My friends, this is a new channel. Um, you would be doing me a huge favour if you liked, commented and subscribed. If you don't wish, that's fine, of course. But if you do, thank you very much. Chapter 1, Childhood Childhood, where life begins. First words, first unsteady steps. You are but a small child learning about the world in which you were born. To you, everything is so new, so baffling, so unforgiving. A long, trying life stretches before you, so many feats and faults, so many fateful choices to come. Yet you are always sowing the seeds of your future self. You are leaning, uh, learning to live and survive in this world, looking for a place within it to call your own, choosing your future destiny. Who will you grow up to be? Prologue, growing up. In the chapters Childhood, Adolescence and Youth, you will live through the heroes coming of age. You will shape the protagonist's personality, his qualities and relationships. By the end of the prologue, you will determine the estates and future occupation of your hero. Only in adulthood will he start to influence the world around him, and even the ultimate fate of the Empire. Who will Yorkie Brandt grow up to be? It's your call. My call, actually. But if you want to give feedback, I'm very happy to hear it. Chapter 1 Childhood Childhood where life begins first words, etc. Right. Events in the personal life of the hero that can happen in this chapter. The fencing lesson. Um, you dare to study fencing like your father, even though you have no right to it by birth. It would need determination greater than equal to four, but... I won't know what my determination is, and it will lead me to train with father. As a small child, you suffer your first death and rebirth. 
um, gain. Fine. And this is uh, insight. You experience an insight when your mother tells you about the ways of the world and the lots of its inhabitants. Conditions, perception are greater than equal to four, which I won't be looking at. And play with ants. A nobleman's sacrament. Willpower greater than equal to zero and kiss the sword. You challenge the sacred order and attempt to seize a noble lot. Your personality qualities at this age, they determine which choices you may make. Determination zero, spineless, perception zero, inattentive. Your inner strength and the number of lesser deaths you have experienced. These qualities will stay with you forever. Willpower zero, deaths untouched. The sections that open this chapter, destiny screen is now open. Personality screen is now available. House of Brandt screen is now available and family screen. Let's have a look at these. We have no chapter timeline yet. Personality, we've seen that. House of... House of Brandt. Reputation 3, Tarnished Honor. Wealth 5, Modest Means. Unity 7, that Peace. And the S, Stefan Brandt. My brother, Relations Plus 1, Indifference. Stephen Brandt, uh, Robert Brandt's son from his first marriage and noble by birth. From a young age, he has been striving to be the first in all things and demonstrates his superiority to his family. And we do not have uh, this yet. Fine. We do not have any of these yet. Begin the chapter. Indeed, let us enter childhood. At first there was nothing, no time, no sensation. Nothing but darkness and void. But then a will breathed life into the nothingness. Matter and spirit were set in motion. History began its march. <laughs> it was your turn, my turn, to enter the world. I'm going to try and switch your to mine because I'm reading it as Yorkie Brand. My first memory, I am lying on my back, blinded by a bright white light. You are, I am not alone. Above me tower the colossal figures of those who created me. I am part of them. They are part of me. Between me and them is an inexplicable connection, a strong, unbreakable link. They will always watch over you, guard you, and protect you. It hurts to breathe. I let out the pain in the form of a desperate scream. My creators extend their hands down to me. There are two of them. The ones who made my form from their own selves and brought me into this world. They are united, yet as they link closer, I begin to see how different they are. I can already feel their differences within me, struggling against each other. The first figure is soft and empathetic, wise and merciful. The love that terminates, uh, that terminates from it wraps me head to toe like an invisible blanket. The warmth it, never ending. Such comfort, such wonder. The second figure is strong and powerful, commanding and noble. It is harsh but fair, a beacon of guidance, a force of protection and merciless punishment for every misdeed. Something to be feared and respected. Yet it is also a third figure. It is like a shadow barely seen behind them yet already pulsing with an unbreakable will to live. It is the very will to live that is now growing even stronger within you. I feel drawn to this one, as if there is a guiding force there. Guiding me, perhaps. A soft open palm, a strong closed fist, a lingering distant shadow. I struggle to loosen the swaddling clothes wrapped around me and extend a tiny hand into the world. But as I say, I am drawn to the shadow. I can do nothing but smile. I smile at the shadow standing behind them. My first of its birth, my first smile appears on my face, awkward yet genuine. My mother and father exchange looks and start talking. I know no words yet, so all I hear is a sequence of booming sound. But the stranger behind them has no need for words. The stranger's look is all it takes 
for you, for me to feel the will to live, an act that now burns within me. The shadow brings a finger to its lips, as if to say, there, there, baby, don't cry, this is our secret now. And then the shadow melts into the light. My willpower has increased to 10. So I will know, I will be reminded of what willpower, etc., are at at the time. But uh, I'm not going to see the as consequences ahead of time. Year 1118. Birth. Life in this world begins. How will I live it? You will have to see. And on to 1119. And the end of the first year. Hide and seek. As the days go by, I learn to tell my parents apart. I recognize father by his heavy breathing and strong, cold hands. He visits me but rarely, but when he does, I recognize him still. That is the fear, that is the respect. Maybe not in those words in this early age, but still. Robert Brandt. Hello there, Yorkie Brandt. Mother's tender voice, however, follows me night and day. Reliable. Something I can take comfort from. Lydia Brandt. My, you're growing up so quickly, my child. There are two more children in the family, named Stepan and Gloria. Gloria sings songs to me. She often dresses me in tight clothing and gently holds me in her hand as I learn to take my first steps. Such fun, such joy from this one. Stepan likes to sweep me up and pinch and toss me in the air. Exciting but painful, I, I know not what to make of it. Lydia Brandt. Oh look, this is your brother and sister. Stephen Brandt. Yeah, you're my little brother. We're going to play together, but I'll always be in charge because you were born a commoner. Well, I do not know those words, of course, but something in his tone doesn't feel right. Gloria, be quiet, you. He doesn't understand yet. Come on, baby Yorkie, let's go play in the yard. There seems to be a, an anger there, a, 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 something not right with her, but then the comfort comes again, the fun. It is hot outside. I grip my brother's hand in one hand and my sister's with another as they help me walk down the giant stone stairs. Then I sit on the ground and start exploring the sparse blades of grass with my fingers. It tickles in the sky far above and away from me is a gigantic pillar, a perfectly straight stick made of light. It is so bright it hurts to look at it. Stefan Brandt. Why are you staring at that shining pillar? It's not going anywhere, you know. No, but it draws my attention. I cannot voice why. Hey, I want to play hide and seek. Gloria, he's just a little baby. How's he going to play? Stefan, then you hide him and I'll try to find both of you. I have no idea what they are talking about, but I support them with Happy Queen. This is strange, but so exciting. Stefan and Gloria glance at each other, then your brother, my brother, walks to a big tree, closes his eyes and starts counting, shouting something. Gloria takes my hand and walks me through the yard. My sister takes me behind some thick bushes by a tall wall. The light from that light stick on the horizon barely reaches here. I can't see home from this place. The ground is crawling with tiny black bugs. Gloria sits me down on the ground and puts her, her finger to her mouth for some reason. Then she's gone. Where, where, where is she? I can no longer hear Stepan's voice. Gloria is nowhere to be seen. I feel colder. The bugs are no fun to play with. I've been sitting here for a long time, completely alone. Nobody checks on me. Did they forget about me? Did they abandon me? Well... I do not know what to make of this. Why am I here? What is happening? Why am I alone? I wait and there is nothing, so... I have waited and there is nothing, so I must... Get up off the ground and start crawling through the bushes to find my own way back to safety. I get up on my feet, swaying a little bit. 
carefully I take a first step, then lose my balance and plop down on the ground again. But I'm determined. I get up again and keep walking in the direction Gloria went. I walk out of the bushes and further toward the wall of the house. Then the most tender and gentle hands in the whole world embrace me and pick me up. Mother has found me. There you are, says Lydia. Such joy, such comfort. Thank you, I feel safe again. I lean on Mother's chest and hold onto her with my arms. I want her to know that I came here all by myself without any help. She pats me on the head. My brother and sister stand behind her, clearly feeling guilty. Gloria is in tears, Stephanie is staring at his feet. And staring, starting at his feet. I hug Mother tightly. She is here now. Determination plus one. Still spineless. I've not had a chance to grow more courageous. Not significantly, anyway. 11.20, the end of year two. The Great Descent. Another memory. I am still a little child, but I can already talk and run around on, on my own. Today is out of the ordinary father is busy around the house, giving orders to the servants. Throughout the day, the kitchen has been abuzz with work, and there are solemn, gloomy preparations and candles being lit. Even my older brother Stefan is quiet today. Mother takes my hand and brings me to my sister Gloria. My son, says Mother, today is the great descent. We honour the day when the twin gods descend to us. They must spend this day in reverence to the gods. You are too young to understand, so just do everything your sister says for now. I nod. Gloria takes me to the playroom. There are no toys there, no chairs, even the carpet has been taken away. There is nothing but a bare wooden floor. I am confused. I don't know what's happening. Today, says my sister Gloria, we're not allowed to go to any other rooms, and we'll be eating nothing but gruel and stale bread. On the day of the Great Descent, everyone must be where they belong. It is quiet, unusually so. Muffled voices from beyond the door are all I can hear. I am sitting on the cold floor, confused, with no idea what to do. Then I hear my sister's voice, a lonely sound in an empty room. It's a little song that Mother taught her. I hold my breath as I listen to it. When the twins come down to earth, they brought lots for every birth. Let us count them, one, two, three. The twins made them for you and me. Nobles rule and bravely fight. They protect us with their might. Please work hard to understand. Guide us by the twins' command. Common people work and toil. Always patient, never spoiled. Live your lot where you were born. For the day when you pass on. Know your lot, know the prayer, the twins see everywhere. I'm transfixed by the tune. Gloria notices my gaze and a smile creeps across her face. You like the rhyme, don't you, Yorkie? She says. Do you know what it's all about? I barely understand her complex sentences. Look, there are three lots. They were brought to us by the twins when they descended to us from the shining pillar. Remember that pillar of light on the horizon? I hear the description and I nod. That's it, you can see the shining pillar anytime from anywhere in the world. If you follow your lot as you live, you'll reach the peak of the pillar. And if you don't, you'll get eternal torment at the foot. You and I are lowborn. Mom is a commoner too. So the lot for you and me is to suffer and be patient and work hard, understand? The priests and nobles have other lots. The nobles fight and rule over everybody. The priests, well, I'm not really sure what they do, but I guess they talk to the twins and then teach everybody. Gloria stares at you intently. Did you get it, silly? Then she shakes her head and keeps singing the song over and over. Her voice transfixes you, draws you in. The room starts to glow like the sky. From this light emerges two figures you have known ever since the moment of your birth. One of them embraces your sister's shoulder. The other stands guard behind her back. You watch this happening before your very eyes, unable to turn away. Gloria is swaying to the song. Unaware of what is happening, she sings the final verses once more. Know your lot and know your prayer. 
I feel compelled by this divine sight to express myself somehow. I feel words condensing within me from the light, but what will these words be? I could finish the song properly. You join your sister. I joined my sister and finished the song the same way I heard it. You had to sing the last line wrong. Shout words of my own instead of the last line of the song. I feel guided by them to sing the song properly. Know your lot and know your prayer. Know the prayer. Will the twins see everywhere. I sing the last line. We sing the last line together. My sister looks up at you in surprise and gives you a nod. The shining pair standing behind her back turns to look at you. You can feel their gaze piercing you from top to bottom. When the moment passes, they melt into the dim light coming from the window. Gloria turns her head to look at where you were st uh, staring. Did you see something, Yorkie? She asks. Gain perceptive. Still inattentive. We have, we did get, I did get perception. Not anymore. I shake my head, not anymore. And 11.21, the end of year three. Year 11.21, spring, the, origi the origin. I am starting to understand more and more of what the adults say. My family is an unusual one. My father is a nobleman, but not by birth. His is a title earned through great service, but my mother is a low-born woman, a commoner. Because of this, I was born a commoner, but father says I may yet come, in, come on to nobility. <clears throat> I learned to read at an early age. Together with mother, I read and learn by heart the many poems about the divine twins, the twin gods who reside upon the shining pillar. Mother calls his poems prayers. Again and again, I try to discern the shapes of gods in the strip of holy light that shine from the sky all day and night. But the light is too blinding to gaze upon. The greatest joy of all is when the stairs are no longer an insurmountable obstacle. Now I can climb and even jump from step to step. Father urges me to be more careful and avoid climbing too high. But even though I keep falling, I never stop being curious about the world around me. When, you, when I fall, I just pick myself up and carry on. My older brother Stepan now spends less and less time playing with Gloria and me. Playing with commoners is beneath his nobleman to be. Uh, beneath a nobleman to be, he says. So Gloria calls him names and Stepan pulls her pigtails. One fine evening, Father gathers us all in the sitting room with an announcement. We will have another little brother or sister soon. Gloria asks him to bring home a little sister. Another brother would be too much. Stefan gets frustrated. There are too many little siblings getting in his way as it is. Soon, I will be an older brother, and it doesn't really matter who the youngest will be, a boy or a girl. I will love them the most. When Father comes back from his trips, he reads his adult books aloud. Oh, for me. Unfortunate choice of phrasing there, but we shall pass on. I find those stories of wars, generals and rebellions quite enchanting, and Father approves of, your fasc of my fascination. Study hard, says Father, and maybe one day you will become a noble, like uh, of the mantle and earn your sword. But first, you need to grow up. Growing up, the concept is as terrifying as it's alluring. A lot of suffering. I keep staring at the carpet under my feet. I'm both ashamed and proud, and it feels odd. A scratch on my hand stings a little. Stephanie is standing next to me, sniffling from pain. My brother was training in the yard with a wooden sword. I wanted to play with him, but he ended up getting angry and throwing the sword at me. The stick hit me in the shoulder. I picked it up and hit him with it. I see Mother's shoes walking uh, to and fro on the carpet. I do not want to look up. I'd rather not see her angry. She is not as gentle to you these days. Why did you hurt Stepan Yorkie? asked Lydia. 
I stammered out an explanation. He hit you first. Yeah, I just hit him back. How dare he pester me like that, asked Stefan. When I grow up, I'm going to hit him with a real sword. Mother shushes us both and speaks to me again. Her voice is stern, and yet you can feel her concern for you. Even if Stefan hits you, you cannot hit him back. You are my son, and I was born a commoner. Our lot is to suffer. But your brother was born from a noble father and a noble mother. His sacrament is coming soon, and then he'll rule over the likes of us. If you hurt a noble, you must be punished. That is your lot. And the sooner you learn it, the better off our entire family will be. Now Stefan looks at you in triumph. I look up at Mother in fear, not sure what to do now. These may be the words of Mother and Father, or others like them, but these are not the words of the, of the twin shadows that came to welcome me that others could not see. This is wrong. Explain it. Explain it, Mother. Explain it. Mm. I start asking questions. Why we were born a commoner if your father is a noble? If I have a uh, father's name, why can't I have his lot? And why can't I choose a lot for myself if I don't like the one I have? Mother is stunned by all these questions so I'm peppering her with. Don't you dare ask me about that, Yorkie. I'll violate my lot if I start explaining it all to you. I'm a commoner, not a priest, she says. I am flogged in front of your, my entire family. The pain burns on your skin again and again. Tears keep rolling down my cheeks. Feels like the punishment will never end. It hurts to walk. When I am finally let go, I slowly climb the stairs and walk to my room. I see a book on my bed. The teachings of Isatius, Volume 2. My tears have dried now. I begin to read, slowly making my way through the difficult words. Every death of the body uh, bringeth the soul ever closer to the twin's judgment. And when the body dieth a true death, the soul soareth to the shining pillar. The twin gods do judge every soul, and their judgment is stirred and unforgiving. He who followeth his lot in life from birth shall melt in bliss atop the peak of the shining pillar. The words confuse and elude me, instilling fear and awe. I will read this mysterious book again as I grow up. Perception increased. Now curious. <whistles> Glorious rhymes. Mother mostly stays in her chambers now. With each passing day she grows heavier and her features get rounder. It gets difficult for her to walk, but she still smiles all the time. One day she takes my hands and puts them on her big belly, and I feel a movement deep within her. I will soon have another brother or sister. Gloria takes me on walks to the yard now. I explore the yard together. We explore the yard together under the evening light of the pillar, and she sings me songs and tells me amazing stories. Hey, Yorkie, do you want to hear a rhyme? she asks. I wrote it myself. There's even a bit about you, but don't tell anyone, okay? Writing poems and songs is only fit for nobles. If Mummy hears about it, I'll get flogged. Remember how you got flogged for hitting Stefan? I do, my sister, and I shall not tell anyone. But what they are saying is wrong. It makes no sense. That is not the... That is not what I'm feeling from the shadows that welcomed me. The, light, the beings of light, the twins, the ones who stood behind you, though you did not see them. Our judge is my second father. In the past, I had another. Mother says the twins are great. Should we... It says we should not fight our fate. Brother loves to jump around. Please don't fall down on the ground. See, I wrote a little rhyme. Please don't tell them that it's mine. But today, your sister is nowhere to be seen. She promised to take you to the old pond and show you the red frogs that lived there, but then she vanished. The servants join you in your search. Even Mother leaves her chambers when she hears the commotion. Finally, you find Gloria in the far corner of the garden. She is holding a quill and sheets of paper covered in poetry. Mother becomes angry the moment she sees it. She looks through the poetry and her face grows dark with rage. 
Gloria is standing before her, wringing her hands and looking for an opportunity to run. There seems to be no escape. What is this nonsense, Gloria? asked Mother. We talked about this. You were told to take care of your little brother. You were absolutely not allowed to entertain yourself with this writing. I can decide that for myself, Mum, says Gloria. No, you cannot, says Mum. It has already been decided by the gods. And he's not a little brother anymore, he retorts. He doesn't need a nanny, and I need some time alone to think for myself. I'm not hurting anyone. You are a commoner and a future wife, says Mother. It's time you learned how to properly care for children. Had your disgraceful former father kept me in his house, you could have been born a noble. That is not our fate. And you are absolutely forbidden from ever spoiling paper and wasting ink again. Mother grabs Gloria by the hand and takes you both into the house. The scribbled sheets fly into the fireplace. Gloria sobs violently. You're a bystander to this scene, unsure of how to act. I know I, can, I know I have to defend my sister. I have to do something. I certainly am not going to complain about her. My determination is too low anyway, but I would not. Offer to write rhymes with her. That we could do. I could comfort her. Leave the room. No, she enjoys the writing of rhymes. I'm going to offer. I don't know how to do it, but she can show me. Mother leaves. The last of your sister's poetry burns away in the fireplace. I hug my sister and whisper to her. Let's go to the library, I say. The two of us can hide on the table and write something together. Gloria shakes her head violently. Mother said no and there is no way she would ever defy her. I reassure her that it will be my secret, our secret. I pull Gloria to the library. She fights me, but I refuse to relent. I'm determined. I carefully peek inside. My sister takes a small book from one of the shelves. And I read it. We read it together under the table. It's a book of poetry about eternal love. Gloria clearly adores it. I decide to write a poem of my own. She recites a line in ecstatic voice, and I repeat it after her, and offer a rhyme of my own. She nods happily. I do this until we do this until the day ends. I've written a poem of my own and learnt it by heart. But not a single line of it has been committed to paper, which means that I I stay true to my mother's rule. And there we are, we're up to three. And as we're going to 11.22, the end of year four. Which will be year 11.22, winter, the coming sacrament. Mother is in her armchair, knitting woolen jackets, pants and socks for the little one. The baby will need to be kept warm, she says. Father spends less time at home now. Mother says he's very busy with his important job. He's a judge, after all. One day, I decide to ask Mother about Stefan and Gloria. How come they're brother and sister to you, but not siblings to each other? Well, my dear, she says, I didn't give birth to Stefan, you see. He's the son of another mother, and Gloria is the daughter of another father. Come now, don't knit your brow like that. You'll understand when you're older. How is that even possible? We're all family, are we not? Several days later, Mother calls Stefan and Gloria into the sitting room. I sneak in after them. At first, Mother gets angry and asks me to leave, but then she relents. You are told to sit still, be quiet, and remember every word I hear. When I enter the temple, bow, bow to the twins. Oh, when we enter the temple, bow to the twins. First to the elder on the right, and then to the younger on the left. Stefan, you're a nobleman to be, so walk along the side paved with marble, where the benches are. Gloria, walk al uh, along the sharp side. When you're there, you must get down on your knees, each on your own side. Stefan, kiss the sword. Gloria, my daughter, they will strike you with a lash. Don't be afraid of it. Resign yourself to the suffering it brings. It's a blessing of your lot. Gloria doesn't like the idea of the lash. I'm not surprised. 
These are not the actions of the twin shadows. This is not it. This teaching, this thing that's come to this world has been misrepresented. This is wrong. There's a tense feeling in your chest as well. In my chest. I was told to remember this. Will the last strike me too one day? On the next day, they take my brother and sister to the temple. I run towards them when they finally come back. The back of Gloria's dress is soaked with blood. She's hunched a bit, sobbing quietly. Stephanie's putting on airs, acting prouder than ever. Nothing else looks different about them. It's like all... It's like all this is the same. And yet, everything has changed. Each of the mess accepted their lot. We lost a relation with Stephen Brandt. My brother. Family unity has gone down to disagreements. Brother and sister sacrament 11.22. My siblings Stephen and Gloria took their first sacrament at the temple. <coughs> right, let's just have a look at destiny. We have uh, personal life. Birth, brother and sister sacrament. Perception 3, determination 1 and willpower 10. We have reputation 3, tarnished honor, wealth 5, mod moderate means, and unity 6, disagreements. The heir is Stephen Brandt. This is my family. Gregor Brandt, my grandfather. His children, Amelia L. Born, ex-wife. Robert Brandt, father, who married Lydia Brandt, my mother. Lydia Brandt is a child. Gloria, my sister. Yorkie Brandt, me, and Nathan Brandt, my brother, my new brother. Our children are both Robert and Lydia, and Lloyd, Robert had a child with Amelia, Stephen Brandt. Very well, my friends, join us next time as we continue the progress through childhood and see how else I can develop in this world. Very well. <laughs>